guys, welcome to lecture 10. We're going to be learning about the different tools that astronomers use in order to look not only at the night sky, uh, but how they see what a star is. And this kind of leads to how we get some of those really cool pictures of stars and comets um, and nebula that are across our universe. There are various tools used by astronomers based on what portion of the electromagnetic or EM band they want to observe. The EM band is the electromagnetic spectrum. It contains radio waves to gamma waves and everything in between. Um, and uh, you're, you're going to have a slide on this in a second where I'm going to show you the colorful, quote unquote, colorful spectrum. Uh, but basically, an astronomer needs to be able to see different parts or different wavelengths. Uh, and to do that, they need to have different tools. And so these tools include telescopes, radio dishes, neutrino detectors, spectroscopy, photography, yes, even photography, uh, computers. Uh, and it's all based on where you want to see. Do you want to see gamma radiation? Do you want to see radio waves? Do you want to see visual light? Do you want to see infrared? Do you want to see x-rays? Yes, x-rays. Um, and combined. They will combine all these different bands of pictures that they've gotten of the same thing in order to get the really beautiful uh, pictures that we have of things like the Crab Nebula. The nature of light, as you should have learned in physics, is to move in a wave and as particles all at the same time, unless we want to photograph it and then it's just like, I'm going to do whatever. But generally, for sake of argument right now, it moves as a wave first. And so the nature of light, in our case, is a wave. And so we measure light waves, especially for the EM band, by wavelength. How wide is the wavelength? That tells you how fast or how slow light is moving. And that is what's going to determine which part of the electromagnetic band you are in. So when we get to the electromagnetic nature of light, um, changing the electric current in a light wave alters its magnetic field. It will go into more about this in the coming lectures. However, due to Albert Einstein discovering the photoelectric effect, we now understand wave particle duality. Sometimes light will act as a particle, <laughs> with that particle being a photon, and other times as a wave, but seemingly at the same time. And the magnetic and the electric portion of light move at right angles to each other, which we can see right here. So this is our electrical, which is our up and down. And then we have our magnetic, which is going at the right angle. So here's the electromagnetic spectrum. A starting point for understanding the spectrum is that the visible light that we see, such as red to blue, is only a small portion of the scale. It only goes from about 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers. Very, very tiny. Some birds can see in infrared. Bees can see in infrared. Some animals and birds see in UV. Bees, for example, also see in UV. That's why they look for things that are white, uh, because to them that's a flower. And so if you're wearing a white shirt, they tend to follow you around because UV radiation. Thanks, we'll quote unquote see in infrared. And one thing that I will explain to you here is you're seeing these lines. And the farther towards radio you go, the less squiggly they are. And the closer to gamma you go, the more squiggly they are. Let's explain this very quickly. On this side, you have slow moving wavelengths, meaning the length here is long very long. It's so long that we can't see it, first of all. Two, it means it's not energetic, so it doesn't have a lot of energy on this side. It's also going to really not affect us. It's not going to hurt us. The radio waves don't hurt us. We don't feel them when they move through us. They don't give us any weird residual uh, lasting effects because we are actually in radio wavelength all the time. Microwaves they don't actually hurt us. Infrared does not hurt us. Well, we feel infrared because it's warm. It, it won't hurt you as it moves through you. Visible light does not hurt us. And then we move to the other side where as we go this way, we get progressively more squiggly. That means we have an increase in energy because our wavelength is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. The shorter the wavelength, the more energetic it is. So we start with UV. We call it UV radiation. This is a type of light wave. Even though we cannot physically see it, it can harm us. It gives us sunburn. 
This is why we wear UV protection. X-rays, we use this to see our bodies, to see if bones are broken, to see if we have cavities in our teeth. Again, it is a shorter, we're getting shorter and shorter here. We're having an increase in, electro, in electron volts, meaning we have an increase in energy as we go from UV to X-ray. These can also hurt us. This is why you have to wear that lead jacket when you go into the dentist. This is why they cover your neck and certain parts of your body to prevent you from getting cancer from too much x-ray radiation. And then we get to gamma. Gamma is the most dangerous for us. It does cause cancer in us. Gamma radiation is also surprisingly a treatment for cancer. But yes, gamma radiation has the most energy. So it has the smallest wavelength. So the highest amount of energy. Gamma and x-ray radiation are actually kept from us by our atmosphere and much of UV. From Earth, we are limited in what we can see of the spectrum. We are protected from certain frequencies, gamma radiation, microwave, and UV. But we can learn a lot from these frequencies, like accretion disks around black holes and, and quasars. We can see these with these frequencies. And I say see with, with close. From our surface, only radio waves and visible spectra are able to be seen. However, we do have some telescopes like the Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea, Hawaii, which are on tall mountains that allow them to see in near infrared. So it's not completely infrared, it's almost infrared. It's kind of like a, a halfway. Uh, in order to observe these other spectra, we actually have to put instrumentation in space, like the, like the Hubble telescope. So let's talk about near infrared. Near infrared, you need gold or silver plated mirrors, super cooled charged couple devices, which also uses the photoelectric effect. It's kind of like a computer chip before photography. It's known as a CCD. You will find these in your camera, but they have super cooled ones. You have some small secondary meters, mirrors, and you have to have cooled telescope tools. Everything needs to be cold. So that's why they're at a high altitude. Examples of near infrared machinery that we have is the Gemini North Telescope at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Please remember that in your study guide, you do need to write down the examples of uh, the different type of instrumentation. So remember, near infrared, Gemini North Telescope, Keck Observatory. So now let's look at infrared. Infrared is, remember, seeing heat. Infrared from Earth requires a high altitude or basically be in Antarctica. Examples of these include flight observatories. Basically, you kind of have to be in space at a high altitude, like getting from being in a plane or in Antarctica. Uh, so flight observatories include the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, and then we have our orbiting observatories, where we have IRIS, which is the Infrared Astronomy Satellite, Midcourse Space Experiment, or MSX, Hubble's Near Infrared Camera and Multi-Object Spectrometer, also known as DICMOS, and the Spitzer Space Telescope, also known as SST. X-rays are a high energy frequency and are only visible from space. Before 1970, the only way that scientists were able to measure X-rays were by sending sounding rockets traveling 100 kilometers above the surface, carrying Geiger counters to measure them. Now we have orbiting observatories in space. Examples include the first X-ray satellite of Uhuru, the Einstein Observatory, Roentgen Satellite, or ROSAT, which is more commonly known as, ASDA or ASCA, the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer, RXTE, CEPHOSAC, Chandra X-ray Observatory, and the XMM Newton. And with X-rays, we can observe some pretty amazing things, like supernova remnants and pulsars. Uh, this is the Crab Nebula, is a supernova remnant powered by a pulsar at its center, which is actually right here. It's super cool. You can, we can see the Vela supernova remnant, which has a radio pulsar at its center. And this image was actually taken by the High Energy Astronomy Observatory or the Einstein Observatory, which is its other name. They can, we can also see black holes and their accretion wedges. The orange in this image is the microwave frequency and the light blue is the X-ray frequency. Now we're going to talk about the ultraviolet spectrum. This allows for scientists to study very hot young stars. And I mean very hot, not like, you know, Hollywood hot. I mean the population of young, very hot stars in spiral galaxies like our own. So I guess they're kind of like superstars to scientists, but 
You also need to have space observatories in order to do this type of frequency or to see this type of frequency. And examples of this include the first UV observatory, which was put up in 1968, which is this bad boy right here. It is the OAO2, or the Orbiting Astronomical Observatory. And then you have the Copernicus, which is the OAO3, the International Ultraviolet Explorer, the Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope, Hopkins Ultraviolet Telescope, Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer, Goddard High Resolution Resolution Spectrograph, which by the way, Goddard, Goddard is the place to be for up and coming scientists. If you want to work in space observations, if you study volcanoes, earthquakes, pretty much anything and everything, you go to Goddard. And Goddard works directly with NASA, which is super neat. The Hubble's Faint Object Camera, or FOC, and Space Telescope in Imaging Spectrograph, SPIS, and the Far Ultraviolet Spectroscopic Explorer, also known as FEES. So again, with UV, you can see very hot young stars, such as what we see in the Orion Nebula. And this image was taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope. The gamma frequency is the highest energy radiation uh, frequency, which results in it having extremely short wavelengths. Sources of this gamma radiation is supernovas, or are supernovas, neutron stars, and intense gravity regions, and of course, active galaxies that have large and active black holes at their centers. Examples of spacecraft that we use to see, see this type of radiation is the Explorer 11, which was the first one in 1961, the European Space, A Space Agency cosine p uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, International Gamma Ray Astrophysics Lab, Intergal, and the High Energy Transient Explorer Mission, which is known as Hete 2. And with this, we can see things like the Andromeda Galaxy. This is a UV image of the Andromeda Galaxy. It's super duper neat. Radio waves are the largest wavelength in the spectra. They are actually so large, we are able to capture them using a disc, like a satellite dish you use for cable, but giant. The frequency range for radio waves is 300 gigahertz to 30 megahertz. Radio astronomy is used to study a wide variety of topics, but the most common use is the mapping of hydrogen emissions. Why? Well, they're important. It is from these emissions that allow scientists to determine the spiral structure of our galaxy, basically using the Doppler shift. As hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, it is scattered and part of the clouds of dust and gas within galaxies. Hydrogen exists in one of two states, aligned and opposed. When it's aligned, the proton at the center is going one direction and the electron going around it is also going the same way, which is known as the aligned state. Well, sometimes it goes backwards, so it becomes opposed, where our proton goes one direction and our electron goes the other direction. This is spontaneous. It, it will happen one time every 400 years, which will cause this opposed state. And when this occurs, a photon is released, which can be detected at 1,420 megahertz. Due to the abundance of hydrogen, this is very easily detected because there's a whole bunch of photons being fired at once. Radio imagery is constructed from the waves captured, and it looks like this when it's given colors. The red in the image is the highest levels of emission, whereas violet is the lowest. So now let's get on to astrophotography. ECD photography, as of the 20th century, has been the best way to take photos of stars. Professional astronomical photographers use their photos for analysis, not just art. However, Astrophotography is quite beautiful. From astrophotography, we're able to do photometric analysis, meaning that images created through UV BRI filters, which is ultraviolet visual light and infrared filters, um, allowing scientists to study star magnitude or, or their luminosity. Uh, wide field photography is used to search for supernova, such as in this photo. The supernova is actually this blue spot in the middle. Wide field images for all sky imagery, uh, photography in specific spectra can occur, and images can be taken from the Earth's surface and through telescopes like the Hubble. We said we can take photography at certain spectra. That means taking photos on the microwave scale. 
And this allows for some really cool and beautiful photos to be taken and created. So we're going to talk about spectroscopy now. Uh, this again will have some more detail attached to this in the future as we talk about magnitude and measuring spectra. Spectra is second to photography and the combination first astrophysics. Uh, the origin of spectra or understanding of it was when Newton held a prism up to sunlight and saw that it split the light into colors of the rainbow. And in the 19th century, Joseph Fraunhofer took a spectra of the sun and noticed it had dark lines. In 1857, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen experimented, yes, Bunsen as in Bunsen burner, experimented with lab chemical spectra and determined that each chemical element has a unique spectra signature, which they called spectral line. You may have done this, chem uh, this experiment already in chemistry class. Essentially, what you do is you have a Bunsen burner lit and you burn different elements and you see what color forms in the fire. And that essentially is how we know that each element has a specific spectral signature, which is a spectral line. And these spectral lines are what we use to figure out, hey, what is that star made of? Does it have hydrogen? Does it have helium? Does it have lead? Does it have lithium? What is in it? And we can actually take that from this. Kirchhoff's three laws stemmed from this finding, and astronomers use spectra of the stars and galaxies to better understand their composition, which is Things we mentioned way in the beginning in the first couple lectures when we talked about finding exoplanets and how we know based on spectroscopy what the composition of their atmosphere is just because of their star filtering through their atmospheres towards us. And it's because of this that we know that planets that we have found so far may not be habitable for us. So we're going to talk about the three laws. So our first law is that a black body processes a continual spectrum, free of any spectral lines, meaning all the colors. A black body is a theoretical object that emits all light and radiation directed to it. Our second law is that a hot transparent gas will produce emission lines when light passes through it. Emission lines are a series of bright lines that occur against a dark background, which tells you what uh, elements you have present. And then our third law is that a cool transparent gas in front of a black body will produce absorption lines, meaning it will absorb certain elements. Absorption lines are dark lines on a spectra that would appear in the same place as a hot gas cloud comprised of the same elements. Computers are actually pretty important for data analysis. Most astronomers prefer a Linux or Unix computers since most of their software is actually made for these programs. For those of you who have not used either, it's different. You need a completely different system. A lot of people in engineering tend to prefer these programs just because a lot of your, your programming languages run easier and better in them. Anyway, computers are very important for data analysis. Most um, astronomers use this for imagery and data processing which allows them to actually remote access data and remote access telescopes. Basically, if you're at a different university, uh, let's say you're at the University of Miami in Ohio. Yes, there's University of Miami in Ohio. It's actually a pretty big, beautiful campus. And you need data from the Hawaiian Observatory, the Keck Institute. Well, you're not necessarily going to have the funding to fly out to Florida or to Hawaii. What you can do, though, is remote link to their computer database and get all the information you need and actually control the telescope for yourself, which is really neat technology. And now we're going to get to neutrinos. Neutrinos are a byproduct of nuclear fission at the cores of stars. They are also released during supernova. These particles actually pass freely through anything and everything, meaning they have a very weak detection. So how do we actually detect them? Well, we basically have tanks of water or chemicals of some sort with photomultipliers. It's essentially stuck in, in the ground, underground, is a vat of water or some sort of chemical with a photomultiplier in it. And they aren't really affected by cosmic rays this way because they are underground. Neutrinos, like I mentioned before, don't really interact with anything. Uh, so how do we actually measure them? Well, occasionally a neutrino collides with an atom, producing a light. And these collisions and light flashes are measured by the photomultipliers. 
So by having these underground and not being affected by cosmic rays, i.e. sunlight, we're actually able to see these collisions with light. So now what I need you guys to do is to go ahead and right click these and open them up and watch these videos. You're going to have some questions in your study guide related to them. Do not click them more than once. It's easier to just open them in your browser and leave them there. Uh, anyway, that is our lecture for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please enjoy uh, the Coursera. There's one on telescopes, detectors, and the Hubble Space Telescope, which give you a lot more information than I could have ever have given you. Um, and they're actually really cool, and they do give a lot of interesting information. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed our lecture, and I'll see you guys next time.